All right. I'll turn this on, I think. Hello. Okay. All right. How are you guys doing today? Oh my goodness, that was so lame. How are you guys doing today? Oh, wow, much better. Man, it's like you're actually happy to be here and alive today. Good job. All right, well, um, full disclosure, um, today, well, first, before I get started there, does everyone get a handout with one of these, like, sermon notes things in it? If you did not get one of those, can you raise hand, and John, can you come and give these out for me? And if you need a pen, there's also pens on the back table, and John can bring you those too. On the back right here, John, right there. <laughs> but um, what we're going to do today is a little bit different. Okay, hand out pens, and here you go, hand those out. So you just keep your hand raised, and John will give you a pen and, and one of those handouts. It, it was in your handout, but if it wasn't in there, then... Um, then you can get one of those. But full disclosure, uh, Sam Dag was uh, was supposed to preach today, but he got super sick, and then he um, called me yesterday and was like, "Oh, I cannot do it." And so that's where Sam and Maddie and them are. And so I don't have like an official like message, of course. I'm um, getting told that late last afternoon. So, but but I had this plan that I was going to do during our Bible studies. And so what we're going to do today is a little bit different. It's going to be a little bit more interactive as well. Um, as we go through today, but we are talking about, um, the last few weeks, we've been talking about being created for community and the idea being that we have been created to be part of a church community. And the reason we need church, the reason we need a church family that we all need to be a part of is we need accountability in our lives. We need people that are going to push us to be loving and do good works. Hebrews chapter uh, 10 and verse 24 and 25 even says that, that we're to push each other to love and to good works, that we're not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, to always meet together as a church. So we need that accountability. We need that encouragement. In, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, it says that you encourage each other and so much more as you see the day of appearing. Then also in the, in the New Testament, as you read through, we see all of these passages in the New Testament that talk about like the one another passages. They're passages that say, love one another, care for one another, serve one another. All of those need to be fulfilled within community, need to be fulfilled within the church family. And as the, all those letters in the New Testament that were written specifically to churches, those are commands that are given to church families to fulfill with one another. And that's something you can't do on your own. Obviously, you can't do one another ship by yourself. Um, if you can, there's lots of problems going on. All right. Uh, but then the next, the final thing is to fulfill the mission of Jesus. Jesus gave us a mission to do here on this earth. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20, he says, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe or to do, to follow everything I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you all way, even to the end of the world. And so that mission of Jesus is something that we can't do alone. We have to do it together in community as a church with one another. So we need that. We've been created to be a part of a church family, and we need that in our lives. But we've also, as we talked about last week, we've been also created to be in the community that God has given us to be a part of, right? So we've been created, God has given us and put all of us here in San Francisco, in the Bay Area for this time to be part of this community and to be an influence and be a light here in this community. We learned last week about Esther, right? And how Esther was put in the right place at the right time for such a time as this to save many people alive. And even though it was a very hard situation she was in, she boldly took up that cause and, and saved many of many people. And so when we're thinking about that, when we're thinking about that we've not only just been created to be in community with one another in a church, but also that God has given us to this specific community at this specific time a mission to fulfill, we go back to Matthew chapter 22. And in Matthew chapter 22, in verse 37 through 39, it, Jesus gives his great commandments. And this is what he says. Jesus um, said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now here's the thing. We cannot say... That we love God without loving the people that God has created. 
We cannot say that we love God without loving others. We don't love the things that God loves, then we don't really, we're not really loving God with all of our heart, soul, strength, and mind. And so when it comes to this and we think about loving others, I have a question, okay? And this is where we're going to get a little interactive, all right? So what is the most loving thing that you can do to show love to your neighbors? What do you guys think? What is the most loving thing that you could do to show love to your neighbors? Lay down your life for them, okay? Serve. Do unto them as you do unto yourself. Love them like yourself. Spread the word of Jesus. All right. Yeah, fill their needs as you can. Okay, so as we're thinking through these things, and we're thinking through, like, what is the most loving thing that we could do for a person, let's think of a couple of scriptures, right? So let's think of Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, where it says this, that God demonstrates his love to us, meaning he shows his love to us, and that while we were at sinners, Christ died for us. So how did God, in that verse, show us love? He gave his life. He gave Jesus to us. He shared Jesus with us. Think of John 3.16, right? That when God loved the world, for God so loved the world, that whosoever, or that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So God loved the world that he gave his son. So as we're thinking through this, as we're thinking through what is the most, there's so many different ways that we can show love, serving them, caring for them, helping others, caring for them like we care for ourselves. But when we're thinking through what is the highest level of love that we could ever show to a person, we have to love them like God loved us. And what God did for us is he shared Jesus with us. He gave us Jesus. He gave us a way out of our sin. He gave us a way that we can spend eternally, eternity in heaven with him. He gave us Jesus. And so when we think through how is the mo- what is the most loving thing that I could ever do for another human being, the most loving thing you could ever do is share Jesus with them. It's to tell them, hey, there is a Savior out there that loves you and cares for you and wants to rescue you from your sins. That is the most loving thing that we can do. But a lot of times I think we ask the question, okay, how? How do I go about doing that? Like, I understand what the Great Commission is, that our mission is to make disciples, tell people about Jesus, and help them follow Jesus with their lives. And I understand that one of the most loving things I could ever do is do exactly what God did for me and share Jesus with me to get me saved, allow me to go to heaven. And I understand that, but where do I start? Like, I don't know if you guys ask the questions or think like, do I just start off with saying like, Hey, you need Jesus right now, right? Like that, like that. Is that how we start? Um, Probably not, right? Probably not the best way. Um, But how do we start it off? What do I say? How do I start that conversation, right? I remember, I remember for me, um, and I'll tell this story a million times if you keep being part of the Branches family, but hopefully it just, it'll just kind of cement it in your mind because this was my story. Um, I was going to Bible college for four years studying to be a pastor, and I worked at a place called Armstrong Forensic Laboratory. I was not a lab technician. I was the guy that picked up the trash. But um, anyways, that, but that, w- that put me in a very unique position because that meant every single day, there's about 35 people that worked in this lab. I would have to go throughout the entire laboratory picking up the trash, and, and I got conversations with every single person, at least a little short conversation, every single day. But over my four years of Bible college, four years of working at Armstrong, I only ever actively shared the gospel with two people, which is kind of like shameful a little bit. And, I, and I'm, I'm sad about that because I look back on it and guess what? No one from my work ever came to church. No one from my work was ever saved. No one ever got discipled because I just missed out on all those opportunities. So when I moved to Ohio and we started our first church there, I worked a full-time job at a place we worked on yachts, as I've said before, um, at a ship-shaped marine. And I knew this part of my life had to grow. I knew this part of my life had to change. I had to start sharing the gospel with people. But I didn't understand how. How do you do that? How do you start these conversations? And um, I took our teenagers to this conference. It was called Dare to Share. And it was a conference that was basically to help teenagers share their faith. But everything you learn there can apply to anyone. It doesn't matter how old you are. And it really taught me some, just gave me ideas and it gave me that passion to actually share my faith. You go for like a day and a half to this conference. They give you all these ideas 
And then literally part of the conference is you just go out into the streets or into the mall and you start putting into practice all that you've learned. And it gave me that passion. It gave me that end to understand how to share the gospel. And so as I worked at Shipshape Marine for four years, there's about 30 guys that worked there. I was able to share the gospel with every single one of them and, and enter into gospel-like conversations over and over and over and over again with all of them. And as a result, there was people that got saved at, at the place. There's people that came to know the Lord. You guys know Sam Dag, right? The ball guy. He's who I met. I met him at work at Ship Shape Marine. And I said, hey, would you like to do a Bible study? And he's like, sure, I'll do that with you. And he got saved and he got discipled and he surrendered to the Lord and he moved all the way out to San Francisco with us to start this church. And that's what happens if we take those opportunities to share Jesus with other people. So what I want to do today, again, is a little bit different, but I want to share with you three tips on how to share your faith. And they're very practical. They're very easy to know how to do. It's not, you're not memorizing long, long scripts or all these things. It's something that anyone can do from the oldest to the youngest. How to share your faith, okay? So the first one, if you have your sheet of paper there, is what I call or is called AAA, okay? Triple A. So ask, admire, and admit. A lot of times we wonder, how do I get that conversation rolling with somebody? How do I actually start the conversation? And this is a great way where you can talk to anyone, whether they're a stranger that you're sitting next to on an airplane, or whether your best friend you've known for your whole life, or just a casual acquaintance that you know. This is a method that you can use to talk to anyone at any time about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's called ask, admire, and admit. So the first part is ask, okay? So instead of just coming out at them, right, you ask them what they believe. If you look through the Gospels and you look at Jesus' life, one thing Jesus did over and over and over and over again was ask questions. Many times Jesus' way into his spiritual teaching was actually just to ask people questions, get their responses, get them thinking. And so you ask people questions. One thing, this shows that you actually care about them right? You're not just going to tell them something. You're actually going to actually try to care about what they think. You care about who they are. So you ask them things about who they are. But as far as the entry question, this is a question that you can use as a segue um, into, a, into sharing the gospel. And this is the question. You can write this one down beside it. And this is a question that's a great question to ask. You say, do you have any spiritual beliefs? Do you have any spiritual beliefs? A lot of times we think that there's going to be this contention, right, if I bring up Jesus. But if you notice the conversations that you have at work or that you have with your friends or neighbors, you talk about pretty much anything under the sun, right? And this is a very easy way to ask somebody what they believe without getting contentious. It's not abrasive anyway. It's really just in heartfelt saying, hey, do you have any spiritual beliefs? And usually with that, that gets them thinking and they usually end up being more honest with you and they usually tell you exactly what they might believe, whether it's I do have or I don't have and this is what I do believe in. So the first thing is ask them and you can get that. You can be talking casually with them and just ask, hey, do you have any spiritual beliefs? And that's a great way to just um, ask that, enter into that question. I've used that question probably Man, dozens if not hundreds of times at this point, and I've never had anyone respond to it um, in any type of bad way at all. They just usually share with you, oh, well, that's a good question here. This is what I believe, right? So you ask them that question. The next step is admire, okay, admire. What you want to do is you want to find something about them and their system of belief to admire, okay? Admire something like, um, again, promote them. So whether they have any system of belief, right, they actually have faith, right? Everybody on this earth has faith in something, right? Even someone that is a, a staunch atheist and believes there's no God, they, it takes a level of faith to even believe that, to believe that the world started absolutely from nothing, right? And so everyone has a level of faith, so you can admire that. But also try to find common ground with them somewhere, all right? So this is, might be how it works out. So say you're saying, hey, do you have any spiritual beliefs? And you say, oh, well, um, I'm a Buddhist, and I believe in that and believe in everything about it. And, you know, in Buddhism, they kind of believe that 
everything is connected and interconnected and everything like that. And you can say, you know, I really admire that, that you just believe that everything kind of goes together and is connected in that way. I, I believe the same thing. I believe that creation and human beings, that we're all connected in this same way to this one source, right, to God. And so you admire something about it, whether whether they're an atheist and they say, well, I don't believe in God, I don't believe anything. And you're like, man, I admire that faith because that takes a lot of faith to believe that all of this just came from nothing, right? And so you find something to find common ground with them on. Again, this is you showing that you actually love them, that you're not just trying to tell them something, but that you actually care about the person you're talking to. And then finally, the last one is you admit, okay? You admit what... The truth is, you admit what the Bible teaches, you admit the gospel, you admit what you believe. And so you start to tell them, okay, well, this is what I believe, and this is what I think, and this is what the Bible teaches, and this is the gospel, the good news of Jesus. And you can do that through several ways. You can piggyback off of whatever you admired about them, right? So they have some kind of common ground, like they have a great faith in something. Like, you know, my faith is based in Jesus, and talk on from there. Or you can simply just share your testimony. And you say, you know what, the reason I believe what I believe is because of what God did in my life through Jesus. I was a sinner. I was lost. I had no way out, no hope for the future. I knew I deserved punishment for my sins, but Jesus rescued me from that. And so you admit then what you believe, and that starts the conversation with him. So ask, admire, admit. Those, this conversation is kind of like my standard for whenever I'm talking to people about the gospel, whether whether it is uh, someone I just first met, a total stranger, or someone that is I've known for years, this is an easy way to get that conversation started, right? And it's a way that's not abrasive or awkward usually at all. It's just simply, hey, do you have any spiritual beliefs? Yeah, I do, da, da, da. And you can start the conversation from there. Ask, admire, admit. And so work through those things in, in your mind and, and just think through that question. Maybe even this week at work or with a neighbor, work that into the conversation. Say, hey, do you have any spiritual beliefs? You know, And you can even talk about even tomorrow morning. You can go home from church and you say tomorrow morning or Monday, depending on if you have off tomorrow or not, or Tuesday. Um, you could just say, hey, how was your weekend? Oh, my weekend went great. Right? Awesome. What'd you do? Da, da, da. This is what I did. What'd you do? Okay, I'm glad you asked, right? And I got to go to church this weekend. And hey, by the way, do you have any spiritual beliefs? It's that simple. A lot of times what we do is we freak ourselves out. And that's a, that's a trick of the enemy. To make it more crazy than it needs to be, it can just be simply having a conversation with someone. And if you keep this in mind, the AAA process, ask and I admit, it's a great way. So, second, number two, great way to share the gospel is by the three circles. Now, if you were here on Easter, actually as part of my message, I did this, okay, as part of the message. The three circles is very simple. It's a simple way. It's an engaging way because you're using a notepad or something. You're using just these simple pictures, and it's a very simple way to explain the entirety of the gospel, basically from creation to revelation, um, and just using these three circles. And this can even be part of your admit process. So when you admit what you believe, you say, you know what, what I believe is, actually, can I show you just real quick on a piece of paper, these three circles? Yeah, okay. And you're able to go into it from here. So I'm going to need John to come up and help me real quick. And I'll walk you guys through this. Okay. John, hold this. Make sure you hold it in front of your face so no one can see you. All right. I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right so here's the three circles all right and you say hey have you ever heard of the three circles before um no i haven't well it's just a simple way to kind of show you what i believe so the first circle is this and this first circle represents our world <laughs> he said it's a noble our our world is broken right and this is the best way, and this kind of going off of the script a little bit, but this is the best way to start a conversation with someone because you're starting on common ground. Everyone in this world understands that this world is not perfect. You'll never talk to someone and be like, do you think the world is absolutely perfect? Yes, everything is absolutely perfect. No one ever thinks that. So you're actually starting from a place where everyone is in agreement of, and you're actually also starting from a place of need. Here's the thing. Jesus does not matter unless there's a need to fulfill, right, for people. 
It's like, why should, why should I even care about Jesus? Well, it's because we're all sinners, right? And that's where you're starting off. You have said, you're using the word brokenness, which people understand. So you're saying the world is broken. All you gotta do is turn on the news, right? Think about even how you can work that in just modern times right now into all the horrific things that happened with the shooting in Texas, even this last week, right? You say, look at that and just how broken our world is. Or you can just see, um, everything. The fact that we went through a pandemic and people died from that and there's diseases and there's trouble and there's all these kind of things. The world is broken and people will always agree. Yes, the world is broken. Then from there you say though, but here's the thing. God did not create to the world to be in that brokenness. We got to think of what God's original perfect design was this. And this is the second circle. Second circle represents God's perfect design. God's perfect design, when he created the world, it was absolute perfection. There was no sin. There was no death. There was no sorrow. It was perfect peace and harmony all the way through. But here's the thing. We, as mankind, we sinned against God. And that sin threw us into brokenness. It threw, it caused this sinful brokenness to spread across the world so that every single person is a sinner. Every single person is broken and we do broken things. And that brokenness, what it does, because God is perfect, it actually separates us from God. Like a wall up between us and God where we cannot have a perfect relationship with Him because of that brokenness. And then here's what we do. We try to escape that brokenness through all different kinds of ways, whether, whether it's through medicating ourselves, whether it's through relationships, whether it's through finding fame and fortune or whatever else. We try to escape that brokenness, to find things to fill that void in our lives, but it never works. It never lasts. It ends up just throwing us straight back into that brokenness. And what happens is we die in this brokenness, separated from God. That means that we are eternally separated from God, and what this place is often called is hell, where we're always eternally separated from God. But here's the thing. God did not want us to die in our brokenness. So there's the third circle. God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who was 100% man and 100% God, down to earth. And he lived a sinless life, never once was in any state of brokenness himself. And so he went to the cross and he died on the cross for our sins. So here's what happens. If you're in this state of brokenness, all you have to do is turn from that brokenness, believe in Jesus Christ, trust in him as your savior and and make him the Lord, the king over your life. And what happens is Jesus crushes and blots out that sin. So it's almost as if you have never sinned. And what the Bible tells us at that point is that it's at that point that we are restored in our relationship with God. And the Bible even calls us a new creation. That we've been made brand new and that we forever, for all eternity, will be in God's perfect design with Him. And that life with Jesus, it starts now and it lasts forever. And then you can just simply ask them, so of these, where do you think that you see yourself at? In God's perfect design or in brokenness? And from there, you can continue the conversation. If they say that I'm in God's perfect design, then that's leading to the fact that maybe they've already believed in Jesus, and you can ask them follow-up questions about that. Or if they say, you know, I see myself in brokenness, you can say, you know what? Well, there's a way out of that. What is keeping you now from believing in Jesus? And they have various reasons, and you can talk to them about that. So this is called the three circles. It's a very simple way. It takes about three minutes without the, all the extra stuff that I talked about to share someone. And you could do it on a note card. You can do it while you're at work. Hey, let me show you. Flip around. Share it with your neighbor, anyone. I want to show you guys a video of how this has actually worked out in real life. Thank you, John. Everyone give John a hand. <laughs> All right, so here's a video of how this works out in real life. Is anyone, is anyone changing the free circle people? Have you done the free circle before? Has anyone ever changed the free circle people? Have anyone ever changed the free circle people? So this is the first circle. So this represents the world that's broken. All of us live in a broken world. We only have to do 
skin on the new year's eve suffering yeah. small sickness rape disease it's everywhere right but you know god didn't actually create the world to be like this full of broken and sad he's a ticket circle this circle represents god's perfect design god's perfect design is a world without brokenness a world for love for joy and peace yeah. and unity but what we did was we sinned Things could be anything from lies to murder. And what sin did it separated us from God's perfect design and threw us into brokenness. And so people try all kinds of different things to get out of brokenness. You might try drugs, alcohol. Or maybe chasing a career or money. Smoking. Even bullying other people at school. Or sleeping around seems like exactly a good example. But it doesn't actually fix the problem of brokenness. It's like a bungee cord. We just get snapped straight back into brokenness. And ultimately, if people die in that state of brokenness and separate from God, that means that that's eternal separation from God. Do you know what this place is often called? Yes. So what God did was he didn't want to leave us in that place. God loved us so much that so he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. Jesus was God. So he had no sin. And when he died and rose again, he actually took on all of our sin and cancelled it. Like he crushed it. And he said if we would turn away from our sin and believe in Jesus and make Jesus the Lord of our life, we become restored, restored back into God's original design. And you become a new creation, a new person in Christ. And it restores back into relationship with Him. So there's only two kinds of people in this world people that are in brokenness or God's perfect design. Where would you see yourself? Probably like those ones. The bungee stage. And where would you like So where would you like to be? Would like to be here? Yeah. 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 So here. So is there anything that's stopping you from turning and, and believing in Jesus? And allow him to be Lord and King of your life. Stopping you. Probably not. Three weeks ago. You know the awesome news about Jesus? He is the only one. If you try to clean yourself up before coming to Jesus, it's like trying to get clean before you take a shower. Is there anything stopping you? We shared the free circles with 34 people. Four were already believers. 13 chose to remain in brokenness, but some were deeply impacted. And 17 wanted to leave brokenness and receive Christ. There are many powerful ways to share the gospel. And the free circles is a great place to start. All right, so that was that video was done with real people. Um, it was done in New Zealand. And if you know anything about New Zealand, New Zealand actually their main religion of New Zealand is no religion. Uh, they have like one of the highest population of atheists for any country in the world. And so um, a lot of those people, that was just a simple way to share the gospel with them. And several of them came to know the Lord. And so that is a, a simple thing. Um, I'll put that video as well as kind of like the script that you they used um, in an email this week. And that way you can just kind of review it and go over it and just be, again, a simple. They did that, as you saw, their little countdown. It was in three minutes that they did that and was able to share the gospel with someone. All right, the final way, the final way is this, is life in six words. Okay, this is a gospel acronym. Um, this was uh, developed by that conference I told you that I went to, Dare to Share. They developed this, and they developed these six words, this gospel acronym. It's an easy way, again, to kind of have it in your mind how to share the gospel. On the back of your page, there's actually a list of those phrases. And so here's what's really cool, though, before we get into that. Um, in, in this page, you can see on here, it says the download the app, okay? And um, most of you probably in this room do have a smartphone. If you don't, that's why I kind of put the information on the back there for you. But you can scan that code. It'll take you to the website to download the app. Now, what's really cool is on that app, it takes you through those six phrases um, to kind of share the gospel with someone. But what's awesome about it is you're able to kind of put in your contacts into that app into what's called the cause circle. Whether you're praying for someone, 
you've cared for them, you showed them love, helped them out in some way, or that you've actively shared the gospel with them. And what it'll do, you can set up reminders on your phone. Well, it'll remind you to pray for them over those people. You can do daily or weekly. And so um, this is a great app. I encourage you to download it. And what's awesome about that as well, you'll see on that page it says branches group code. There's actually a group that you, if you download it and you become part of the branches group on there, then we cannot see all the names that you put in, but we all together can see how many people our church is actually praying for, how many people that we're actually caring for, and how many people that we're actually sharing with. So I would encourage you, uh, as part of our, our branches church here, is to download that app if you have a smartphone, and then try to put in at least five contacts into that, that um, resource there that you can start praying for. And you can even have an option when you put it in, you click a button that says pray for, care for, or share. And that kind of shows you the stage that you're in with that person, whether you've just started praying for them, or you actually started caring for them, you've served them in some way, or where you've shared the gospel with them. And I encourage you to put in five, five people at least. And if there's 20 of us, at least there's more than that in this room that download this uh, app and put five people in, then that's a hundred people that our church is actively praying for together and actively trying to reach. And you're welcome to put more than that, but I would suggest at least putting five. And so here's where um, this comes into play, the gospel acronym. So this is, as part of the app, it's right there for you. So if you're ever sharing the gospel, you can just open it up. And what's really cool is you can share these phrases with someone. And I don't know if you can see this, but there's actually a little button right here that has like an open Bible. And it has the verse, the corresponding verse that goes along with that phrase right there. So if you're actually sharing with someone, you say, hey, here's what I believe. I'm going to give you a list of six words. And you can click that little Bible. It'll pop up the verse right there that you can read to them as you're sharing this. So it's really cool. So the first one is this. God created us to be with him. And I encourage you to memorize these. Okay, it's just six phrases, super easy. And again, this helps you to kind of understand what the gospel is. So you start from creation. God created us to be with him. Right? He created us to be in that perfect relationship with him. But then it goes on. Our sins separate us from God. It's kind of like that three circles again, that line that goes up. Our sins separate us from God. And then it goes on to the next one. Sins cannot be removed by good deeds. That's a common fallacy that a lot of people think, that if I'm just good enough of a person, I can erase my bad. But that'd be like the same thing as you committing a crime, standing before a judge and saying, judge, I know I committed the crime, but you should let me off free because I've done some good things. He would be a terrible judge if he let you off free. You still got to get punished for your crime. And that's the thing. Our sins cannot be removed by good deeds. But here's the good news. Paying the price for sin, Jesus died and rose again. Okay, he, Jesus came. He paid the price for our sin. He crushed that sin. If we put, or, And then uh, the next one is everyone that puts their trust in Jesus alone has eternal life. If we put our faith and trust in Jesus alone, we can have eternal life. And that life with Jesus starts now and lasts forever. Okay, And again, that's all right there in the app. And I encourage you to memorize that. It's just a framework for the gospel. As you're sharing the faith, as you're sharing your gospel with someone, it's a great way to kind of share that God wants us to be with Him. Our sins messed everything up. Jesus made it right. And if we put our faith and trust in Him, we can live eternally with Him. Okay? So, um, again, you can download this. It's the cause circle right there. You show you like the, the circle of how you actually start witnessing to someone. You start praying with, for them. Always start with prayer. It's the Holy Spirit that does the work in someone's heart. We cannot save anyone. Okay, a lot of times we think, and I was even at, someone was asking me about this this week. If I just said the right words, then they would be saved, right? And so we put a lot of pressure on ourselves. But this is, again, there's always three parts. There's God's part, and he always does his part. There's our part, and that's our duty to speak up, to say something. And then it's finally, it's their part. They have to make that choice for themselves. And so, but we always start with prayer. Care for them. Show them love in some way. Give them a gift. There's that old phrase that is very true that people don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. And if you're willing to share and care for someone, love someone, that can melt even a heart of stone. There's a guy in my work I've shared with you guys before that hated everything to do with Christianity, was constantly hating on me and calling me Jesus boy and all this stuff, right? 
But I just kept loving him and I kept serving him and kept just being a friend to him. And it really just melted his heart. By the end of the time at Ship Shape, he even said, you know, I'm, you almost convinced me to be a Christian, right? And he went from someone that hated everything about it to, and he saw how real it was. And that's just through serving him and loving him. Serving and loving people kind of melts their hearts. It gives you more opportunity to share, share the gospel with them. So you can go in there. You can click on that cause circle. There's a little addition button. You, it allows you to add people. Like I said, add at least five people if you can. And then you can join a group. On the little ellipsis at the top, you can click. It says groups. Go on there. You can put in that group code, which is also on your paper. And it'll pop up the branches group. And you can be a part of that group. And we can start praying for all of these people together and see how we're doing as a church in this. So that is three simple reasons. And just remember this. At some point in time, someone shared the gospel with you. Whether it was a family member, a friend, a co-worker, a neighbor, somehow you came to know the Lord. If you haven't come to know Christ yet, and I urge you to talk to me afterwards, I can show you from the Bible how you can know for sure that you are saved and that you're going to heaven. But if you do know Christ, somewhere at some point someone shared with you. And this all comes back to God. God's love propelled him to share Jesus with us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He gave Jesus so that we can be saved. And if we are to love God with our whole heart, soul, strength, and mind, then we need to love others enough to share the truth of the gospel with them as well. All right, I hope this was a blessing to you guys. I hope this was an encouragement. And I hope that this week that you're able to even maybe start this gospel conversation with someone or at least get a prayer list together where you're able to start praying for your neighbors and coworkers and friends and asking the Lord to open up doors of opportunity to share the gospel with. And if you pray that prayer, if you pray, God, open a door for me to share the gospel with someone, God will answer that prayer. So it's one of the scariest prayers to ask, but he will answer that. And he'll allow you to have opportunities to share the gospel. So let's go ahead and pray. And as we pray, just start thinking through these people. Allow God to bring these names and faces into your heart so that we can share the gospel with them. Lord God, I thank you for this wonderful, awesome, and magnificent day. And I thank you, Lord, for your love for us and your kindness and your grace. God... Without you, we would be lost. Without you, we would have no hope for the future. We'd have no hope in heaven. But you loved us so much that you shared Jesus with us so that we could know you. And not only that, Lord, but you sent someone at some point to share the gospel with us. And just as that person openly shared the truth of who you are with us, I pray, God, that we can be that same, have that same boldness and that same passion and that same love for the people that you've put in our lives. That we might share the truth of who you are with them so that they can know who you are. So that they can be rescued from their sins. That they can have a confidence that they have a home in heaven and peace and love for all eternity. God, give us boldness, give us strength, help us to pray actively this week. And as a church, help us to fulfill your mission that you left us together. I pray these things in your son's amazing name. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand and sing together and just be praying over these people.